Hi, everyone, and welcome back to another ACCN podcast. I'm your host, Shivani. And I'm your host, Cassandra. And today we're joined by Harriet Bradshaw-Smith, from who will introduce herself and the amazing work she's doing in the clean energy sector. Hi. Hello, hello. Um, I'm Harriet Bradshaw-Smith. I work for the Carbon Trust, and we manage the Transforming Energy Access platform on behalf of the UK government. Great. So Harriet obviously works in the clean energy uh, space, specifically in sub-Saharan Africa. And so I'm curious to understand what is the importance of access to clean energy in sub-Saharan Africa and why is it important as an agenda for the UK government? Absolutely. Um, Yeah, so we got the sustainable development goals. Number seven is is, um, to do with access to clean and affordable and reliable energy. the goal is to have everyone having access by 2030, but unfortunately we're not quite on track. Um, I think around 600 million people in Africa will still be without clean and affordable electricity by then. Um, but like, why energy? Um, without energy, it limits your development. You, know, you can't do your homework after school. You don't have machines working at hospitals. You can't have lighting on streets, um, even things like... Um, Uh, traffic lights don't work Um, and it's very interesting to see how that changes um, society and how it works um, when you don't have simple things like that functioning Um, the use of like unclean fuels as well like causes of health issues um, and also climate issues as well and then also energy really supports economic activities and job creation Um, and also there's the element of dignity and safety so I mentioned street lights again um, you know, for women walking alone at night, whether they're foraging for a firewood um, or just working back, walking home from their shift, um, you know, it's more dangerous to walk in the dark. Mm-hmm. Um, why is it important for FTDO? So global emissions need to be reduced. And a, one way of doing that is renewables. Um, the FTDO are really um, focused on partnerships and they believe that the clean energy transition can be enabled via partnerships. So that's p- partnerships between you know, donors, between um, private companies, uh, between individuals working together, entrepreneurs, like the whole ecosystem. Um, and then, yeah, I kind of touched on this earlier, but the access to clean energy improves outcomes such as health, education, poverty elimination, and climate change mitigation. So you know, we're all in this world together, so we have got to try and make it better for everyone. Cool. And, yeah, I guess you're working at Carbon Trust, and so what are some of the cool projects that you are funding and supporting within uh, Sub-Saharan Africa and outside to be able for this transition into clean energy? Sure. So, I mean, Carbon Trust, firstly, is a big sort of global organization. There's about 400 of us across the world and we're a climate change consultancy so we do lots of work with corporates um, in the UK and in Europe and Latin America and Asia um, but uh, our work in Africa um, which I'm a part of is really based on the transforming energy access platform um, that's not to say we don't have other projects within <laughs> um, Africa we have a team in South Africa who do loads of other things um, but the T platform um, it's a £220 million um, UK government funded programme. It's got like, four main um, delivery partners. So we sort of lead the consortium that delivers this. Um, for Carbon Trust, we then manage four or five portfolios of work, and they span anything from um, like technical assistance programmes to um, innovation programmes that are looking at different types of um, PV um, to university masters. Um, so one of them is the low energy inclusive appliances this is a really big R&D so research and development program um, that focuses on appliances um, to make sure that they are um, sort of, well, the most efficient when it comes to using renewable sources um, and also um, they do a lot of work with their customer base to work out you know, what the customer wants Um, We've got the T Learning Partnership. This is run by the University of Cape Town, and this is about a partnership of universities um, across Africa and Asia and the Pacific Island region. And they have developed master's courses which are implemented within engineering uh, master's um, degrees. And so they, it's about having energy access 
um, and that sort of social development side of it um, within an existing engineering program. Um, so hopefully your future engineers will come and think, oh, mm. maybe we won't just like put a diesel generator here instead. Maybe we'll have a mini grid. Yeah. Um, yeah, of course, we've got the Energy Access Talent Initiative <laughs> um, delivered by Shortlist and AMI, um, which is about upskilling young people across Africa um, and placing them in jobs. So yeah, a huge, huge range. I could go on forever and list them all. <laughs> but um, I think you have a really cool job um, looking after all these programs. And I'm pretty sure you've learned quite a bit from mm -hmm. when you started working on these programs. Would you be able to share with ACCN some of the things you've learned about the opportunities um, on the continent surrounding clean energy and the mm -hmm. energy access transition? Yeah. Um, perhaps before I go into like what I've learned, I can give a bit about my background. Yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah okay. I'd love to hear that. Yeah, so um, I originally did an English literature degree. Um, reading is my first love. Um, and but that really opened my world to seeing how many opportunities there are outside in the real world as well as in the fiction world. Mm -hmm. um, and then from then, I actually worked for a mentoring charity, which focused on the UK, young people in disadvantaged communities, um, giving the mentor to really sort of look beyond their own settings and to support them with things like homework and confidence and um, self-control and all these things. Um, and whilst I did that, I did a master's in international development. So mm -hmm. then I worked in international development for a couple of years. And so I don't come from like an energy or engineering perspective. Um, I frequently have to Google what um technology <laughs> relatable means, content yeah. yep <laughs> yeah <laughs> um even pv i think i do know what it means but you know we'll see um so yeah i entered the energy access space thinking i was more of like a general project manager someone who is organized and i like, can like look after budgets and talk to people but not knowing a huge amount about energy access um and i think one of the main things i've really learned is that it's such a big ecosystem when when I think of, when I thought about international development before and I really thought about like health you know you think about oh who are the players in that it's it's governments it's donors and it's NGOs but when you think about energy access you have those those groups doing their thing but then you also have the private sector and you have manufacturers and you know recruitment companies putting people into jobs and you have HR specialists, you have project managers like myself who like support the grant making. You like it's more it's really complex and you can see it everywhere and anywhere you look. Um so yeah, I really have learned a lot about the ecosystem and how powerful it can be to be in that space. I think everyone who works in energy access is like really passionate about it. Um and it also extends beyond just energy access because of the, uh, the innovation that comes with it, um, the different opportunities to explore new markets. Um, you know, one of the learnings at the recent forum of conference we had in Kigali was during a humanitarian energy session. We had a private company who are based um, near Kakuma in Kenya, and they hadn't before ever worked in um, a refugee displacement setting. But they realized that there was a market there. They realized that they could sell solar home mm -hmm. systems there. And so they started doing it. Um, and I think they changed their like plans very slightly. So the upfront payment was smaller and the, the amounts you pay on monthly were smaller. But it meant that they could then penetrate a new market um, and expand their operation. And it's gone, well, from what I can see, pretty well so far. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I think that's just really exciting. And again, it just like speaks to that ecosystem of how many different players are, are there are. And did you have, um, this is now not in the list of questions we sent you, but <laughs> now that you've mentioned it, um, did you have a difficult time transitioning into the sector or have you found that it's quite um, straightforward or easy or accessible to get all this information that enables you to do your job? Mm. I think... Um, so because before in my previous roles, I was always gaining basic like, project management experience. Um, it was, I was always angling to become a project manager, a program manager, that type of role. So I knew what skills I needed. Um, so whether there was like budget management, um, uh, looking after FCDO reporting uh, templates or a log frame, if anyone knows what that means, you know. I know Cassandra <laughs> does. All the fun yeah, things. Yeah, it's my favorite yeah, thing. All yeah. The, yeah, all the fun <laughs> things. Um, I knew... 
I needed, I mean, because I have a master's in international development, I do have like an understanding of like development economics, Mm -hmm. not in a mathematical sense, but in a a social science Mm -hmm. sense. So I gathered basically transferable skills um, throughout my career until now. Um, And then I've had opportunities to train. So I've I've done a Prince II qualification. Um, But learning about the sector, I mean, I think, again, I think the energy access sector is very generous. Like, there are so many webinars out there and like conferences that you go to and you learn and you listen. Um, working with the programs that I look after, I've like, learned loads from my colleagues. Um, and like, you know, there's loads of resources out there to read if you want to know more about like specific well, technologies or or ideas um, or sectors or contexts as well. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, quite a lot of learning by doing, but it makes it quite sustainable for me anyway. Yeah, yeah. I can relate. I mean, we work together on the Energy Access Talent Initiative. So I also came into the space as a career project manager, similar to you, uh, with all these experiences and transferable skills, I'd say, into the sector and have been on this learning journey for about a year and a few months now. Um, No shortage of resources that we can tap into. So um, I think what we'll do is also share a few of our favorite links um, as part of this episode just to help our audience come along with us on the journey. So if you have a couple of resources you'd love mm-hmm. to share, we'll drop them in the box below, is what I hear people say. <laughs> Bef- before we move on, you guys have mentioned Energy Access Talent Initiative twice. Do you want to explain what the program does for our viewers? Well, Cassandra, <laughs> 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 it's one of my um, my, my programs at, at Shortlist. So... What the program is about is um, through the funding um, FCDO has afforded, uh, the program shortlist in partnership with AMI are training slash upskilling Mm -hmm. and placing 800 men and women across the sub-Saharan continent, Africa. Uh, We'll just write that properly. But the sub-Saharan Africa uh, into jobs in the clean energy sector. And primarily these are people aged between... 18 and 30. And what we're trying to do is create an awareness of the various types of jobs that can be available in the sector outside of your regular engineering jobs or your technical roles. There's so many opportunities um, to enable the sector to grow. And so Shortlist primarily is doing the work of outreach, talking to employers, trying to figure out what opportunities they have, trying to um, help them with the challenges of getting talent into these jobs. And then we kind of match make and make that happen. But with AMI support, we also provide um, work readiness training. So you have people who are hungry, ready, skilled, and then you get them into these jobs, maybe it's their first or second job, Mm -hmm. they get ready for being a whole person at work, being present with skills, um, and being set up for success in a nutshell. Yeah. Amazing. Well, very excited. Love the program, even though I work on it. <laughs> <laughs> Love the program. <laughs> I could be biased, but I think it's great. Yeah, <laughs> it's, no, it's, it's one yeah, of my favorite good, ones, yeah. actually. Yeah, it is a good program. Um, cool, yeah. And I guess in terms of, I know we were talking about transferable skills and like Cassandra and I can relate very heavily around the, the program management um, aspect. I guess my question is that you you said that you were in program management that was the career path that you were taking was it an intentional choice to go into the clean energy sector or the climate sector was that something sparked your interest or was it sort of like you stumbled onto it and then just decided to love it uh, with all your heart Mm -hmm. um i feel like i would have to i should say yes this is where i was angling at (laughs) but if i'm being honest i i was very agnostic like i didn't mind where i went um i knew that i had a certain um set of skills um, and I also, I kind of have this belief that because I, I'm British and I'm white, I'm based in the UK, part of my role is to sort of translate what the UK government want with their various strategies um, and then feed that down into the people who can implement and make the impact. So I never saw myself going and like training to become an engineer to then go and do things or to like, go and, I don't know, teach, mm-hmm. um, you know, that wasn't ever my, my wants. Um, so this role to me is, is great because I get to use, I like stakeholder management skills and, um, 
I try to protect my programs from sort of some of the the challenges with ha- receiving donor funding because there are, you know, it's labor- it can be quite laborious with reporting and um, sort of meeting all those expectations. And I'm fortunate that my programs will do. Um, <laughs> but um, yeah, I think. Um, but then entering the clean energy space has been amazing. I've mm-hmm. really very much enjoyed it, and like you can really see um, the impact it has on women on on young people and i think that's quite that's why it's most exciting about it is that it's because it's like so diverse in what it can do and how it does it as well not just like straight engineering you know it's that social um science side um it's never boring amen it really <laughs> never is <laughs> um and what would you having now worked in the sector for a little bit with all the programs that you're running um if you had like top advice you'd give to job seekers in the space or young professionals interested in pivoting into the space, um, would you have any advice for them? Advice? Mm. Um, well, obviously, seek out Energy Access Talent Initiative. <laughs> um, I think. I think it really depends where you're based, what you're interested in. I mean, there is like so much out there. You know, I think if, um, say you're you're into sales, why not go join an electric vehicle company like Ampersand and sell mm-hmm. electric motorbikes? Like, how cool is that with those batteries? Um, yeah, I'd say do your research, work out what you want, what you're interested in doing, um, whether it is, you know, HR or, um, or sales or um, customer service. There are so many different roles and opportunities out there um, and even within energy access if there are areas you're more interested in whether that is like electric vehicles or solar home systems or the training and the technical assistance part of it or if you are an entrepreneur and you have an idea and you want to try something new in a different market um, you know network look up look up people on LinkedIn um, find these big programs look at what they do see whether they have um, opportunities or um spaces for you to get support and I'm sure you'll find your way thank you I guess in terms of my last question but is what excites you the most of what is happening in the sector right now and then the future like what is exciting in terms of what you're working on yeah I think um one of the things I'm most excited about is so within the within the development space there's a really big push towards localization um, so it's the realization that not everything can be done by Europe or from Europe and or the West, um, and that Africans can solve an African problem. Mm-hmm. Um, on the T platform, we have a local partnership inclusion work stream, and this works across all the programs to try and um, find new ways of how we can as a first point of call, give more grant funds directly to African or Asian um, or locally owned um, partners, companies or programs. Um, And then on the um, other part, if it's not sort of grant financing, how can we help African or Asian or locally owned companies um, get access to financing in different ways? So we are currently developing with EED Advisory, who are a Kenyan-based firm, um, a technical assistance project where they are offering pre-application support to companies, organisations applying for grant funding from T partners. Sounds a bit complicated. Details will be shared at the end of the month. Um, But the idea is that a lot of what we have found as grant makers is that, you know, when we put out competitive tenders or calls for proposals you'll get such a mix um, of quality applications and it's not really about the ideas the ideas are totally fine and probably would sell but the problem is from my perspective as someone who has to manage risk for carbon trust for FCDO if you have an application which is poorly written or doesn't tick all the boxes even though it has a good idea it won't get pushed through so this pre-application support um, aims to help those with a good idea, shape it in a way that speaks basically the language of the grant makers. Um, 
So I'm sure there might be some pushback on this, but this is like really a first attempt within the T platform to do something like this. Um, we are very open to taking feedback on how it goes with the first round that will be coming up in June, connected to Parent Healthcare's Innovation Fund. Um, but yeah, we just basically want to see what happens, um, take learnings from it. So then when we do it again in a couple of months time, um, we can make it better again. That's super exciting because I know a lot of like entrepreneurs and people that are trying to access their like first round of funding always struggle to find like the grant funding and like filling out the application and like they have amazing ideas. So yeah. I'm glad there's an actual program that is Absolutely. coming out um, to support them to be able to like check their boxes and like solve that like root problem that they face. But yeah, Cassandra, do you have any final questions, thoughts? No, I'll see you at my meeting. <laughs> <laughs> no, no more questions for me, but I really appreciate um, you taking some time to come and speak to ACC and about the work that you do, why it's important, and what the potential opportunities are. Um, thanks so much for being here with us today. Thank you very much. Thanks, guys. Um, and thanks for watching.